Uh, welcome on Phil Prairie, the Children's Center. This is our third installment of the Children Lecture Series. Uh, the main premise here is to recognize that on this campus, uh, both students and faculty have the luxury of being able to interact with some of the, the best scholars in the world. And, and we don't often enough take advantage of, of uh, that opportunity. We have these fine scholars teaching students in classes, but there's, there's more to these fine uh, scholars than what we see in our classes, and it's a good opportunity to really see them with their passions, the kind of research that they're interested in, their scholarship. Uh, I do want to remind you, I, I had three things I had to do, I just did one of them, I welcomed you. It reminds you to turn off your cell phones. That's uh, what it is like in, in the year 2014. And my third is to, to introduce a student who will introduce our speaker. And this gives me a delight to introduce Abby Shrorin. And she told me how to pronounce that correctly. But I had uh, a wonderful opportunity last evening to go to the Little Box Theater in the Fine Arts Building and to watch a one-act play written and directed by this fine, talented student. And every time I see events like that, it reminds me, again, of the talent we have on this campus, uh, what amazing students we have, and, and what a magical opportunity when you blend students with faculty. This is what a research university is all about. So Abby, thank you for letting me come to your play last night, and thank you for introducing today's speaker. Anand Bruschke teaches Art History and Visual Studies courses in the School of Art and Visual Studies here at UK. She works on Eastern European art, and since 2008, she has been associated with the Tsinghua University in Beijing. Her current research explores the problem of value and status differences between types of artistic production within culture, art economy, and art history. Ladies and gentlemen.
satisfies the core uh, requirement for uh, citizenship. Um, and then, of course, on the top level, a seminar dealing with methods to introduce advanced undergraduates and our graduate students to you know, how one does things like talking about graffiti, or comics, or advertisement, or vernacular architecture, malls, right? Um, so, so that's the context for this project, in a sense. Uh, but this project also comes out of something slightly different, which is the fact that at approximately the same time, in the mid-90s, and really since 2000, what we used to call graffiti has started attracting more and more serious attention among scholars, first among cultural anthropologists, and eventually among people interested in visual studies and art historians in particular, uh, at least because we started having people like Bagsy, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, her, or them, because we really don't know uh, whether it's an individual or a group. Um, they, Banksy is an anonymous uh, producer, let's say, uh, of uh, street art that looks something like that. It's very often, it creates commentary about uh, current political issues, uh, things in the culture. Sometimes it's very clever, uh, very interesting. So as all of this started happening, in terms of the street art coming to the fore, in addition to just plain old graffiti, um, scholars like myself, like others, started creating histories and thinking about, well, where does graffiti come from? And this is just a very short timeline. You know, I, I found this actually on the web. But to give you a sense of how recent all of this thinking is, let me just say that, um, in 2010, I mean, there have been people writing about graffiti. Okay? There have been articles and kind of newspaper um, certainly notices. But in terms of serious academic books that look at graffiti as a cultural phenomenon, it's a very, very recent field. <laughs> so in 2010, there was a book called The History of American Graffiti that was published by Harper Collins. Um, in 2011, 2012, there was a major show uh, called Art in the Streets, uh, which was curated by Jeffrey Deitch for um, the LA uh, Museum of Contemporary Art and then traveled to the Brooklyn uh, Museum. And then in 2013, so you know, just last year, we had a major publication from a major academic press. Um, the Yale University Press put out World Atlas of Street Art and Graffiti. And that book really is quite different because it has footnotes. It has like all this academic apparatus. So all of a sudden, you know, we are now in this world, let's say since 2010, when people like me are seriously, not just peripherally, but seriously thinking about graffiti. So as this was happening, I also had another site um, let's say venture. Uh, in 2008, um, I uh, received a Fulbright Luce lectureship and um, went to teach art history at Tsinghua University in Beijing for a semester. Okay, and this was at the time when everybody was talking about China, so it was a good reason to be there to just check it out. I was very curious as to what was going on. Everybody was talking about it. Chinese contemporary art was really hot. Um, Tsinghua University is one of the two top Chinese universities. So um, the one that usually is considered to be the humanities universities, Peking University, and then Tsinghua is the top um, engineering school, science school. So this is uh, basically, they always say, it's the MIT of China. And I was at the MIT of China. And this was, i never been to China before, and this was the neighborhood uh, that we lived in, it's called Budapo, um, and it was something like that. And you look around, and this is actually in Guangzhou, in another Chinese city we, vi we visited, um, and you know, whether you are on the street or you go into the alleys, uh, whether you're kind of um, in the places that are housing uh, places where people, ordinary people live, uh, or whether you go into the old historic parts of town. One thing that really struck me, uh, especially when you started looking 
of the subway system <coughs> in Beijing is an absence of something that was very, very familiar anywhere in the West, which is graffiti, right? So it's very often that, you know, in the subway, the, the image on the top um, right is from New York, you know? These places uh, where that are not um, sort of supervised or maybe in which people are, um, um, you know, just basically this is, these are acts of sometimes vandalism, sometimes creative uh, sort of intervention, lots of different things. And it, this is a very common uh, urban phenomenon, something that is worldwide. So the top two images are from US, the image on the lower um, left is from Hungary, the image on the lower right is from Dublin. So you know, just about anywhere you go these days in the city, you will find examples of graffiti. Now, there were types of, let's say, homemade signage in China. And this was 2008, so keep in mind that the timing of this is very, um, very um, important. Why? What happened in 2008? Does anybody remember? Olympics. Okay, the Olympics. Okay, so this was, we were there before the summer in which the Olympics took place. So you could see things like this. Uh, there was a trash can with some numbers scribbled on it. Or you would go uh, in the under overpass, uh, you know, some similar kind of thing. Or you would have stencils, the way that uh, Bangzi does. But they were, again, numbers and text. And of course, I didn't read Chinese, so I don't know what it was saying, but it was numbers and text. And this was everywhere, different numbers, different texts. And it was very obvious that uh, somebody was trying to uh, you know, erase it, cover it up, but as soon as they were covering it up, somebody else was stenciling it back on. And so we, uh, I was asking people what this was about, and they said that this is a form of advertising. It's basically illicit advertising, and usually these notices are uh, to basically, um, if, if you need a permit to stay in the city or you need some, you know, this is kind of a little bit shady business, you know, if you need papers made or something like that, call this number. It's that kind of stuff. So it's actually, this is an entrepreneurial, let's say, uh, signage that is outside of the legitimate um, economy. Now, there are other forms of marking especially in tourist sites. So if you went to the Great Wall of China, and here it is, right outside of Beijing, you would see this kind of stuff where people basically scratch into um, bricks, which are fairly soft, um, statements that basically say, Joe was here. Okay, and this is actually what graffiti originally was. Graffiti means that it was something that was inside on the wall, not necessarily painted. So this actually goes back to the original meaning of it. But because the Great Wall of China is an international tourist site, what was really interesting is finding on the wall um, this graffiti, this kind of signage, sign making in all languages. Um, English, uh, Russian, uh, Gary loves Tom, uh, Gary loves Tommy, uh, you know, the, here is another one. And so it was kind of all over, and it was basically this sort of shared um, experience that I'm sure you have also had of being somewhere famous and wanting to leave a mark that, you know, we were here. Um, a lot of it, though, interestingly enough, was written in chalk or in, you know, with stone, that, or uh, so it wasn't permanent necessarily. But this was really interesting. So here was just this piece of uh, metal and uh, for some reason was left in there. And then um, this was at the wall and you, if you, this was basically the mark of the end of the place where you were supposed to be. And then if you went behind uh, to this area here, this was kind of a dark passage, but what was interesting is that on the top beam, somebody uh, said Poland, would I picked up my ears because I'm originally Polish. Uh, and then on the bottom, there were all these writings in Chinese, right? So again, it's sort of a, an interesting international mark, make, mark making. Okay, we went um, as part of the Fulbright, we traveled a little bit around the country. I was giving lectures at different universities.
universities. So we went, for instance, to Xi'an, which is in the, uh, in the west. And this was on the campus of uh, Western uh, Chinese University, uh, Western China University. And there was a statue of one of the founders. And you know, it looked normal, except when you look very closely, somebody annotated it. So it's kind of like having a picture and putting a mustache on it. But it was very slight, very kind of you know subtle, let's say. And then when you went around it, there was a little bit more. There was a little bit more text. And what I thought was really interesting is somebody, somebody really went in there and tried to, uh, they couldn't quite erase it, so they uh, um, uh, wrote over it. And then there was this rock behind uh, that statue. And on the back of the rock, again, not in front, but on the back, there were all these uh, uh, the, these kinds of references, and basically what this was was like a love rock. So the students from the university would go there and declare their affection for one another uh, on, in this place. Again, something that is not unfamiliar to us, uh, but it's not really the same as the kind of urban graffiti one found. There are other instances that were really, really interesting of mark making in public places that were not um, considered to be uh, sanctioned, officially sanctioned by authorities. So for instance, if you go to Beijing and you go to the um, uh, Tiananmen Square, there, is, there are gardens next to the um, uh, Imperial Palace. And in those gardens, there is a grove of bamboo. Now bamboo is a plant, of course, and it is a form of grass. Uh, so it renews itself, you know, it gets occasionally shut down and uh, whatever, but there is this, what's really interesting is that people started, apparently people were writing poems on bamboo. And again, this is, if you think about it, it's form of graffiti, absolutely, but it's a very different aesthetic, very different attitude from what we normally see. So there was this wonderful growth of bamboo that had all these poems. And then, then the other thing that I noticed that people were doing sometimes is using water to practice calligraphy on pavement. So if you went into certain areas or into certain parts, uh, you would find people uh, with big brushes kind of doing exercises in calligraphy. And if in part this was like really a, a physical exercise, and in part, it was sort of training oneself, one's hand, eye-hand coordination. But again, what was really interesting to me was the impermanence of the mark. The fact that it had this light um, um, footprint on the environment. Again, very different from you know, the, our idea of what graffiti was. Um, now, there, there were instances of the kind of more familiar graffiti, but you really had to look close. Can you see something in here? This is an alley, a back alley in a hutong, which is one of those traditional housing areas in Beijing. Can you see a piece of graffiti? Right here. And again, it's interesting because it's in chalk. <coughs> um, this was done, uh, this is in an area, again, uh, very close to the Tiananmen Square, so kind of a touristy area. Uh, but this was done on one of those shutters. You know, you lift them up and the store is behind it. So actually, when the shutter is up, it's invisible. Uh, but this, is, this comes close to things that are familiar. And then, you know, you're all of a sudden you're walking around and there's love <coughs> on the wall uh, in English, right? So it makes you wonder, well, who wrote this? Was this a Chinese teenager? Or maybe this was an American teenager, because this was a time where there were a lot of foreign students uh, in town. There were a lot of foreigners, period, visiting China. So what got me thinking were a couple things. One, the fact that I wasn't seeing things that I expected to see in a major metropolitan urban area that um, had a lot of back alleys, a lot of places that were not being uh, surveyed, uh, that were not being policed. Um, and then there were these kind of light footprints sort of things that were in the environment that were kind of reminiscent, but not exactly. And then we started going to 798. Does anybody here know what 798 is? Okay, so 798 is a very famous art district. 
It used to be an armaments factory uh, that kind of went out of business and then uh, turned itself into a space for artists. So it was basically full of warehouses uh, where initially uh, sculptors uh, you know, would rent out these huge spaces because they needed a lot of space to do their stuff. And then as they moved in, the galleries started to move in and you had this kind of a process of gentrification. So by 2008, um, this place was chock full of um, commercial art galleries, studio spaces, there was a very important contemporary art center. Um, and you went there basically, if you wanted to see contemporary art in Beijing, you went to 798. When you went there, you saw things like this. Okay, so completely different. And, and this is a thing to keep in mind. You have to put yourself in my shoes. I'm in Beijing now for about a couple months, right, or something there about, and there is no graffiti anywhere. And then you go to 798, and it's this absolutely loud, Western-style graffiti, and it's completely different in its aesthetic and its appearance and its sort of um, the way of addressing the viewer than anything else you can find outside of the, this art zone. Um, and you know, if you went there, like all the walls basically were covered with stuff, all very different. So this is just one of the alleys in 798, and I mean, like literally every building was full of graffiti. It was as if somebody let a whole, you know, bunches of crews just go at it, which is in fact what happened. Um, so you can see, you know, there's a gallery um, uh, advertisement, um, and here's the opening. I mean, you go into the gallery, and on the wall is graffiti. Uh, some of it is in English, some of it is stenciled, some of it is freehand or different styles. Some of it keeps repeating, so we you can actually do almost like a taxonomy of graffiti in 798 because certain things um, keep coming up. There are different styles. You could really you could kind of do comparative analysis on what people are doing, but it was literally everywhere. Not only that, but this was a picture taken in 2008 when they were uh, kind of uh, still building this little area. This was a picture taken in 2009. So the graffiti actually stayed there, the same graffiti, um, these two images, okay? And this was left in there. They planted trees, and then somebody came over and annotated on top of the graffiti, right? And then there, somebody else added another one. So there is almost like, you could almost think of an archeology span of these images and the fact that they were not being erased. They were not being painted over the way you would expect, right? So again, this was very curious. Not only that, but if you started going around Beijing and not just in Beijing, but also for instance, Shanghai or any other major city. So this is, um, it's called the Today Museum in Beijing. <coughs> On the wall next to it was graffiti. If you went to Central Academy of Fine Arts, which is the main art school for the whole of China, so here is the school, and here's the back wall, and there is graffiti. Here is Shanghai. This is kind of like 798, but for Shanghai. It's basically, contemporary art is in districts. It's not in the city proper. It's not basically gallery here, gallery there. It's kind of contained. And so here is an equivalent of 798 in Shanghai. And again, you have graffiti all over the place. And the wall leading to the district and bordering it. So it's virtually as if the graffiti leads you to know where to go in order to find contemporary art. Um, this is an overpass, again, on the way to, um, to, this, uh, to this area in Shanghai. The other thing that I started noticing is that people who were in Shanghai making graffiti were also making it in Beijing. So this is Shanghai, this is Beijing. It's obviously the same person. I have no idea who this is. And this is another area in Beijing uh, called Sao Chandi, which, which is kind of an um, artist village full of galleries, studios, and other places. So obviously, you know, you have these there's a very strange, appears to be, association of a certain kind of graffiti with places that are identified as art-making places. And not just art-making places, but places that are known for contemporary art. 
And this kind of graffiti is not present anywhere else. So, the context. How do you explain this phenomenon? And I'm, I'm doing it this way in order to kind of get you thinking about research. Because research of any sort, whether you're doing art history, visual studies, uh, mathematics, or anything else, starts with a question. So you have to notice something that doesn't make sense. Something that is like, I always say, it's like a pebble in the shoe. You know, something you want to explain. So think of this as my pebble, my kind of thing that I, I just couldn't, you know, I couldn't get out of my head. So I tried to think about what was going on here. Now, Wunako, this area around the Beijing University, I mean Peking University and Tsinghua University and a couple other universities, is one of the most vibrant areas in Beijing. It is hopping from early in the morning to late at night. There are you know, millions of, thousands if not millions of students and young people there. It's full of energy, it's kind of amazing. So you would expect some of these people to be doing graffiti, right? And they're not. So why not? Well, part of it has to do with the culture. So I thought that this sign was really interesting. Uh, it was a sign at an entrance to um, Summer Palace, which is located um, in kind of the same district in uh, Beijing as the university. And I thought, wow, you know, if you're going to spell things out, I mean, one wonders, why do you have to spell this out? So no fireworks. No dogs, you know, that's kind of obvious. Don't make fires, don't bring in guns. Um, this is noise, so no taxis, no, no <coughs> soccer. I mean, it's sort of an interesting thing that everything is spelled out, and there are all these prohibitions about what not to do. Now, in 2009, when we went, uh, what was really interesting is that this was the um, 60th anniversary of the founding of uh, the Chinese Republic. And everywhere in the city, especially in Wudoko, there were people, usually older people, wearing these uh, very bright yellow shirts with armbands. And they were everywhere. Okay, so like literally, wherever you went in Beijing or in this one neighborhood, they were all of a sudden, they were all wearing hats and they were all wearing these shirts, and I mean, you know, I keep found, I kept finding them, so I kept taking pictures. Um, and, you know, it's, they were very friendly and everything else, and so I asked a friend, who are these people? Well, this is the Chinese version of the neighborhood watch. Okay, so these were people who were, in a sense, in charge of policing neighborhoods, or maybe policing just their own apartment block or uh, you know, the corner or something like that. It's kind of a community uh, self-policing, self-organizing. Except that if they didn't wear the shirts, you wouldn't know that they were there. They were just people on the street. But I can guarantee you that the young people who are living in a given apartment building, they knew they were there. And this is a very um, respectful culture towards authority. Uh, towards parents, towards elders. So in addition to all of these prohibitions and all of these signs, there is also this sort of social culture of, well, you should not do something that is not allowed, that is prohibited, because uh, auntie is going to uh, you know, tell you exactly what, what is going on, or she will tell you parents, or uh, you know, um, this will get out. So there is this, you know, the idea that we normally have of young people in the city where everybody's kind of anonymous is actually not quite the way uh, it is uh, what I would expect in China. Now, again, there were all these, you know, these people were doing all this erasing and painting over and painting and all those inappropriate advertisements. But the other thing that, you know, um, one did not find among those mark makings, or at least I haven't found, and I, ha I, I have asked a lot of people about this, is that there were no political statements in those, um, the kind of graffiti you found in the city or the kind of graffiti one found in the art areas, which is actually kind of interesting because a lot of graffiti in a lot of different areas, especially if there are issues that are 
hot button issues uh, that um, you know where people, especially young people, become involved is very often expressed in this way. So you know um, whether you are in uh, New York and uh, you are basically um, against certain policies of the U.S. government, or you are in Palestine. And Israel, and this is Banksy sort of version of that uh, in Israel, uh, you know, kind of commenting on the wall between Palestine and Israel, or uh, whether one is more recently in what was in Egypt during the Egyptian Revolution and Cairo, where I mean it was an amazing flowering of graffiti as a form of political discourse, as a political speech. Uh, you know, amazing stuff that people really invested in. I mean, this was entirely absent in China for understandable reasons, because, of course, one would really get uh, in trouble. Um, during this period when we were there, uh, when I was there, in 2008, 2009, um, as I said, in 2008, there was a run-up to the Olympics, so there was this incredible sort of um, patriotic fervor, uh, not unauthentic. This was not something that was, you know, kind of top down where the government was telling people to be, you know, do it for the show. People genuinely felt, including very young, young people, uh, students at the universities, they really felt uh, a sense of pride in their country, in its accomplishment. I mean, China, in terms of uh, its development since the late 70s, uh, it, it's really a tremendous success story. So there was this sort of you know, great deal of enthusiasm uh, that was also translating into 2009 because of the anniversary. At the same time, there was also suppression of political, um, any kind of a political uh, speech um, and political participation with something that has been going on steadily since then. So, um, you know, everybody knew sort of what the rules of the game were what you could and couldn't do, and why and where and how you could do it. Um, and of course, there were these, and this is 2009, uh, there were these very spectacular events that were celebrating um, the sort of Chinese, um, essentially, independence, the, the formation of the republic. And at the same time, there was also an emerging uh, subculture, because of course by this time China was very rapidly westernizing. I mean, it's uh, you know 2008 may seem very recent, but it you know the changes are very gradual. And by 2008, there was a hip hop scene in Beijing, which was really interesting. There were, you know we went to uh, a jazz concert, um, and there were people coming to Beijing from all over the world that wanted to plug themselves into this emerging youth culture. Okay, so art graffiti. Now, art graffiti is this, you know, this thing that I just described to you, 798 or other art districts where graffiti is essentially featured in the context of contemporary art. So here is an example that I think is really telling because what um, this gallery did is they actually created a billboard, a, sort of a, a big wall that somebody, uh, they gave to somebody to uh, uh, essentially uh, paint and then they hoisted it onto the building. So kind of make it easier for the graffiti artists to mark their space, to make it visible. Um, not taking chances on what the graffiti artists were going to do. In a sense, commissioning graffiti. And then you would walk through 798, and what was really interesting is that it was not what you expected. So it wasn't just young Chinese uh, men and women doing this, but it was an international group. And it was in complete, uh, you know, completely in the open. Uh, people doing it kind of in the middle of uh, other people going to galleries and looking at art. And then the other thing is that was really interesting, and again, it says something about you know why this was happening, is that when you started looking carefully, um, for instance, you, this symbol here, if you were to look this up, <coughs> you discover that this is a crew from France who came into Beijing whether it was invited or not, or maybe they just showed up, you know, and started <coughs> doing their stuff. So, you know, the the stuff that was being sh showing up was um, international. It was uh, not always just Chinese. And then the other thing is that if you look at it, 
mean, okay, if you look at this image and this type of graffiti, what would be the adjective that comes to your mind, other than crude? You can do it, I mean, what do you think it's, it's the message that's being sent here? I love you, and the bunches of people with smiley faces. The term that comes to my mind is cute. It's very cute, right? I mean, it's certainly not confrontational. It's not critical. It's not hard edge. It's not gritty. It's cute. Who heard of cute graffiti? Or this? Okay, a mushroom head with little you know, with a smiley face and, um, you know, stars for eyes. This is not kind of imagery that pushes back in any way, let's say. Um, this was really interesting. These were stencils. And this was at the time when China was um, celebrating the fact that it was sending, um, uh, you know, astronauts into space. So this is, here is graffiti, graffiti, the stuff that is supposed to be illicit, it's supposed to be critical, it's supposed to be edgy, it's supposed to be kind of outside of, you know, standard stuff, actually celebrating Chinese accomplishment. A little strange. Uh, there were artists who were doing the same image, uh, so this was a sculptor who was doing that, and you had, had this kind of repetition. And then on the wall outside of 798, in uh, 2008, there was a sign, and it says basically that this wall was commissioned by the municipal, um, the government of this area, uh, to celebrate what? 2008, what do you think? The Olympics, of course, the Olympics. I love China. The dream, one dream. One world, one dream. That was the official slogan. So here is this form that we normally associate with kind of edgy, confrontational, you know, anti-authoritarian uh, behavior here being essentially used to support uh, the dominant message uh, of the government. And it is something that is very familiar to the Chinese audience because the Chinese government, as all um, socialist governments, was really big into commissioning murals as form of uh, propaganda art uh, in the 50s, 60s, uh, into 70s and 80s. Okay, so what's the code? What's, what's going on here? Let me shift a little bit. So as, as I mentioned to you, I'm from Poland, and my original field was um, Eastern European art. Um, so in 1987, uh, Wim Wenders, who is a German um, director, uh, made this movie. It's very good. I strongly recommend it. It's called Wings of Desire, The Hymn of the Berlin. Of the Berlin. Um, and it's an interesting kind of movie. Um, it's about angels who watch people. Um, and um, one of these angels, these figures, uh, decides, falls in love, and decides that he doesn't want to be an eternal being, that he wants to become human. Um, and he wants to have a real life. Even though that life is going to be short and painful and all of that, he, he wants to give up eternity of watching to participate. And in the middle of the movie is this scene that you're watching here. And what it is, is the no man's zone uh, in Berlin um, that demarcated the space between Berlin, which was a Western city, and East Berlin, uh, which was part of uh, East Germany and the communist uh, bloc. Okay. And so here, what we were seeing is this angel passing from this space of empty white walls painted in white, kind of very sanitized, into the outside. This is his life. And what is really interesting is that when you look at it, the West is full of graffiti. Okay? The West, the freedom, the life is marked as a space of graffiti. And there's this very interesting moment where you know, the film switches from, from black and white 
into color, so it moves from the sphere of the spiritual, of these angels, into that of life. And what you see is the outside of the Berlin Wall, which on the western side was graffiti. Entire thing was full of graffiti, and it was celebrated as a space of uh, graffiti and kind of um, resistance, let's say, um, against it. So you have this, you know, the, the contrast between the blank walls, the clean space, the unmarked space that is under surveillance of the guards who will shoot you if you try to go from east to west, and this colorful, wild, un uncontrolled, uh, unsurveyed uh, space of the Berlin Wall on the other side. I saw this when I was thinking about um, China, and I, it sort of started, my wheels started moving. Um, this is an actual Berlin Wall, which was of course um, um, put up in um, 1968 to separate the Eastern Bloc from uh, the West. And this is the West side, and here is this no man's land that you, you know, if you entered it, you basically would have gotten shot and killed, and many people did. And it's virtually, I mean, there's nothing here because people don't go there. And because also uh, people are being watched, right? So on the other side, on the western side, what was really interesting is that it wasn't just regular people and youth and you know whatever who were marking the wall, but there were well-known artists like Keith Haring who were invited actually to the Ber to West Berlin. They would fly in and they would do graffiti. So here we have Keith Haring doing the wall, and I was thinking. <coughs> What's the difference here? What's what's is there a difference between somebody like Keith Haring, who is a well-known contemporary and a New York artist at this time, and what is happening in Beijing on the outside of 798, where the municipal government is inviting, you know, graffiti artists to come and mark up their wall. And of course, the difference is the context. And this is true both inside and outside. So even though uh, this strip of the wall, this stuff here, is being explicitly acknowledged as being invited, what I'm suggesting to you is that inside of 798, and inside of those spaces uh, that are associated with contemporary art, are also spaces that are allowed to be graffiti. In the sense, whoever is running them is permitting people to do this. And they're not just that, but encouraging uh, graffiti artists to come in and do this. Now, there is a significant difference of the context, right? So in 1989, the Berlin Wall falls down, right? it's taken down, um, and of course the Eastern Bloc collapses, and communism ends, and what's interesting is that the Berlin Wall then gets divided and sold out uh, throughout the world. Uh, if you were in America during this period, you could buy yourself a chunk of Eastern of the Berlin Wall. And then certain sections of it are still preserved. So if you go to Berlin, you can see them. And it actually, the sections that get preserved are the ones that are the most vividly uh, painted. So the, the notion of the graffiti as kind of you know, a resistance against, the tool against oppression, is being celebrated very much within this context. Something very different happens in China in exactly the same year. 1989 students in Beijing, not just students, but also workers in Beijing, in part inspired by what, by what is happening in Eastern Europe, um, start occupying the Tiananmen Square. And of course, uh, eventually that occupation is suppressed, tanks are brought in, and uh, lots of people lose their lives. So you have to take that political context into consideration when you are thinking about graffiti in China um, right now. There was another thing that really sort of sparked my thinking about this in terms of why, what, what does this graffiti suggest? So here was, I was one day walking around 798 and it was just one of the quarters, like, you know, nothing special about it. But there was this big cube of blocks that somebody built 
And uh, you know, some entrepreneur or uh, graffiti artist, you know, he has a white canvas, so it has to be work, right? I mean, it's just begging for something to be done. So about two hours later, I was coming back the same way, and this is what I saw. There was, you know, kind of a clean-cut young guy um, at the wall that was, you know, just two hours ago was spray painted with graffiti, and he was cleaning it. And then this guy came out, who was obviously proprietor of this uh, thing, um, somebody who probably was either a manager or owner of the gallery, this one over here, um, who was essentially <laughs> went to this wall and started inspecting whether it was cleaned uh, sufficiently for his, um, uh, for his uh, thing. And, th and then was this, I took this picture and sort of thought, wow, how interesting. You know, this, this young guy, here are his spray, hands, um, just sort of sitting there looking at this blank wall that he just cleaned instead of paint, right? So if you think about it, what's going on here is it's sort of it's an interesting thing because it's freedom, but it's freedom within limits. Limits that are very narrowly circumscribed. Not only that, but graffiti, which to an outsider, somebody like me and you who comes into this space is shouting kind of anarchy, resistance, uh, you know, anti-authoritarian attitude, actually in the context of China, does not function that way. So it's sort of uh, sending the wrong message for what it actually is, but it's actually a message that wants to be supported within the context of the society, which at this time, in 2008, was trying to sell itself um, to the world as being much less repressive than it actually was, let's say. So, I'll finish up with a coda. A coda is kind of a convenient thing that academics do. So, my original project was about 2008-2009. But just last, uh, and I've, I've been going to China basically every year, um, not always to Beijing. Um, so, I kind of had a break a little bit with Beijing. And in November in 2013, I went back and I was organizing a conference. And it was really interesting. Um, there were still things that were very familiar. So in 2013, there were still these sort of illicit advertisements everywhere. People, you know, Chinese people are incredibly entrepreneurial. If there's business to be made, uh, they take every advantage of opportunities. There were still really kind of amazing art graffiti instances uh, in and around the art uh, buildings, although a lot of the places like the Today Museum that I showed you before get really gentrified. So now they're in the middle of basically a very posh uh, apartment complex, and obviously uh, the people who are running the apartments did not want them to be marked in the same way, so there is much less graffiti actually in those contexts. Uh, there were also these, uh, this was really interesting, in 2013, the government wanted to invite graffiti artists to do art that was supporting kind of happy themes, uh, the dream of China. And so again, you have this kind of a, um, a little clumsy, um, you know, co-option of, uh, let's say, uh, street art in for, um, let's say, ideological propaganda purposes. But there was also something else that I had never seen before. So I was driving in a taxi, um, I don't even remember where I was going, and I did a double take. Because this was just along the highway. And on the highway was that. I had never seen that before. And this is, this is the kind of thing I always expected, which is graffiti in places that are not, do not belong to anybody, right? Because that's where you find graffiti generally. Uh, places that are, I mean, you don't find them in high-end corporate places because you only have security guards. You don't find graffiti in places that where you have police or people that mine things. But you know, people that are kind of, uh, the places that are sort of homeless, that overpasses, underpasses, you know, streets or kind of rough neighborhoods. That's where you find this stuff. I had never seen this before. And here was another one. So this wasn't just one place, one rogue uh, instance. Uh, this was another underpass, again, going in a taxi. Um, and we can see it kind of here. Uh, and it's not even that fanciful. It's just basically mark making. 
And then in Wudoku itself, um, there was a construction zone. And yes, okay, admittedly, it's construction. So it's temporary. It's not a building that is, uh, you know, um, uh, that is permanent. So there is a certain, I mean, you can get away with stuff, basically, in those kinds of contexts. But I have never seen anything like this before. And this was not like small little marks someplace. Huge, huge visible graffiti. Um, really kind of standing out, calling attention to itself. And also doing things that are not nice, right? Um, using English words that are square words. Here, you know, this hand is obviously giving a finger. When wants to know who is this finger directed at, what exactly is this about, right? So again, there is something that is changing. Now, what has changed? Well, the China has a new government. There is a new uh, premier, and also he is the leader of uh, the Communist Party, uh, Xi Jinping. Um, and if you have been paying attention to things, what is really interesting is that he has been pursuing very vigorously uh, a campaign of anti-corruption, which many people have said is masking, actually, kind of cleaning up the house, getting rid of people who are um, not part of his, uh, essentially, um, political allies, who are not his political allies. And there has been a really a lot of suppression within China of political discourse. However, since 2008, the internet has really changed the world. There was internet, there, there were smartphones even in 2008, but not on the scale that one sees right now. Um, people also know how to get over what is called the, in Chinese, the um, uh, GFW, or Great Firewall, which is a censorship system created by the Chinese government that essentially limits <coughs> information flow within China and also limits certain forms of um, speech. Now, there are great efforts to control of this, but it cannot be controlled. It, there's too much, too many young people are doing this. Um, I found this um, cartoon. It was actually, it looks like it was done in 2009 on, uh, on the web. Um, but I think it brings together everything in a really interesting way. Because what you see here is, again, a wall. It's the Great Firewall of China, this invisible network of censoring uh, computers that are basically like you're in China and you look for uh, Tibet or any kind of hot political issue, basically, your browser will throw up a screen and say, uh, this is not permitted to be viewed. And if you keep doing it, it will just freeze it, freeze your internet. Um, so, so that's what this is referring to. But look what is going on here. There is all this graffiti. And the, on the outside of it is the rest of the world, right? So it's this, I think it's a very interesting commentary of what the graffiti that may I may have been seeing in 2013 is a symptom of. It's a symptom of people essentially getting over the wall and joining basically the rest of uh, uh, the world, wanting to join the rest of the world in terms of having access to information, having ability to um, uh, to uh, participate in politics in the way that they want to. Now this is this is kind of uh, symbolic, but if you are at UK campus, you know how many Chinese students are here. So there are lots of people who are traveling now outside of China, especially young people, who understand what the world is like and what they want to do, what they can't do. And sometimes it's not about, I mean, this is not about, you know, necessarily regime change or anything like that. It's not about that kind of pointed politics. Sometimes it's just about access, about being able to get information that you want to get that you're not currently permitted to have access. 